Recently, we passed the four-year anniversary of the national emergency that was declared for uh, in response to COVID-19. Now, that's just kind of how it was. I'm not trying to get into a political um, discussion about that. That's just kind of what happened. Um, and regardless of what you thought about it, many of us had to find new ways or revisit old ways on how to spend time, right? All of a sudden, you were stuck at home, whether you wanted to be or not. Now, people learned new skills. Uh, people picked up new hobbies um, or did lots of research on social media and YouTube, right? That's now how people say, I did a lot of research. And you'll say, how did you do that research? And they'll say, well, I did it all through YouTube or I did it all through social media. And so that became a new thing or just an amplified thing um, during that time. But one of those days during that, during that time when everything was kind of like in flux, I went to Walmart. Um, I was one of those brave souls. And I decided while I was there that I was going to look for some puzzles because we were running out of things for our kids to do. And so when I went to go look at the puzzles, I was really surprised to find that most of the shelves were pretty empty because uh, so many other people had the same idea. Let's do a puzzle, right? Now, I did pick out one to buy, thinking it would be good for Annalise, who at the time was about seven. And it had a picture of a dog in a flower garden. There's an actual picture of the actual um, puzzle that we bought. And she and I got sat down. I said, look, I bought you this puzzle. Let's sit down and start on this puzzle. So I'm trying to teach her. Like, first you get the flat ends, and you put those on the end. She had done some puzzles that were for younger kids before that. But, you know, we made it about 20 minutes into that puzzle. And then she said, Dad, can I do something else? And I said, sure. And I was secretly glad because this puzzle was, like, kind of kicking my behind. It was, I was like, this puzzle was hard. And then, like, what's funny is we just left it there on the table. And my wife, Dawn, she came over and started piecing some things together. Um, then Annalise got interested again, like later in the day and a couple days following it. And the pictures started to come together as they would just find time to put a couple pieces together and that kind of stuff. A few weeks down the road, and we got about 75% done with the puzzle. And again, that's a picture that I took at the time uh, that we had actually done on the puzzle. And you can, kind of, you can make up the dog's face and Although the whole head isn't there, you can tell it's a dog. And you can see the garden and even some of the blooms of the flowers and that kind of stuff. But it's not a complete picture yet, but it's coming into view the more time that was spent on it. Now, the process of taking this box filled with puzzle pieces, broken apart from the whole picture, and then slowly, in our case very slowly, reassembled to look like a completed picture that we see on the front, is very much like, I believe, like what it is like to be following King Jesus into a life of the kingdom of God. Now, we believe that all of creation was made by God, and it was made whole and complete and good. But when Adam and Eve made the decision to rebel and disobey God, and, and kind of rejected God's way for doing things their own way, what was good and what was whole was broken into like a million-piece puzzle. Our lives, even our God-designed humanity, were broken because of sin. For, so, for the many years following that, humanity has tried and continued to try in vain to become whole again. We feel this brokenness, and just as we live life, we feel the wear and the tear on us. We look at things and saying things don't seem to be going like they should. We have this innate feeling like, Things aren't going like they should. And so we have tried for millennia, ever since Adam and Eve, to get that feeling of wholeness, of completeness again. We've tried to do it through power. We try to force things into place, saying, if you'll just listen to me, and if you'll just listen to me, I have the best idea on how this can all work. And so we tried to through power. We've tried through pleasure, saying, if I can just, man, life would be so much better if I just got everything I wanted. And then we get to the empty well, like, and realize there's never enough. We've tried through money. We've tried to accumulate more money and say, I can just buy completeness and wholeness. We've tried through success and achievement, like I can be somebody, then I'll be whole and complete. And we've even tried through violence, saying, don't you dare make my life trouble or I'll bring trouble to you. We've tried all those things to make things better, to make ourselves feel less broken, to make the world like we thought it should be. But this is the equivalent, I believe, to taking puzzle pieces, and kind of pounding them to make them fit. You ever done that? You ever had a puzzle, and like you're like sure that fit, but the pieces don't line up, you're like, forget it, boom, you just hit it, like this is going to work. 
You can tell that I never get frustrated with puzzles, right? <laughs> but when we try to make our lives come back together and complete this way, that's what we're doing. It was, and we try to do it in ways that were never intended by God. But then Jesus. But then Jesus came and demonstrated a completely different way of living, a surrendered way of living to the will of God. Now, it culminated in his death on the cross, his resurrection marked by the empty tomb, and even his ascension to the right hand of the Father. And instead of a broken humanity, what we see in Jesus was that he's living out a wholeness, a complete and assembled picture of humanity. That's when we say Jesus was 100% human. He might have been the only person we've ever met to be 100% human because he was the picture of what, how God intended humanity to be when we see him. How was that accomplished? It was found in living in the center of God's will, and Jesus is the first citizen in the kingdom of God. Jesus is the picture on the front of the box. He lived as the complete picture, the whole picture of what it means to be human. And we know this is confirmed through the cross and the empty tomb. And it's with the events of, of Easter that those things happened. Now, with Easter kind of fresh in our mind, as, as we start to talk about that, we step into week four of this series called Summer on the Mount. The whole idea of, of going through the Sermon on the Mount is that he gave this message, then he went and lived it, and then he dies and rises it again. Is that we, with that information, we can look back through this framework of the cross and the empty tomb. It's like putting on a pair of glasses, right? That we have those on. And so every time that we look at the words of Jesus, and really any time we should look at life, we actually put on these lenses or these frames. Everything's framed by the cross and the empty tomb. And so as we step into Matthew chapter 5 today, what we continually find as we go through the sermon that was given on a mount is a description of a wholeness of humanity only found in the kingdom of heaven. This being human as it, were create, as it was created to be, is made complete and whole completely by God, as pictured on the front of the puzzle box. And so Jesus describes how it is that these pieces of the puzzle fit together and addresses the decisions and the behaviors that get in the way of the puzzle coming into view. And that's what we have through the, all of the Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus is describing not a pie-in-the-sky idea, but a way of life that can be when we are made whole by God. And so, as we step into Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, we'll keep that in mind. Here's what Jesus says. Uh, Matthew, like I said, verse 27, starting in 27 and 28. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, last week, Jamie gave a great message about talking about the idea of um, what Jesus said about anger that plants seeds to murderous thoughts and actions, right? He talked about the thoughts, the anger that's the root of those thoughts and even those actions. And this week, we actually see that he's continuing the same theme of thoughts and feelings that, that are the beginning of action. And so what he talks about is lust also plants seeds, but instead of murder, it leads to adulterous thoughts and actions. Now, if it, are, if it wasn't already clear before the series even began, it should be clear now that Jesus is really, 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 really I'm not stuck in the loop, but really interested <laughs> in our thoughts, in our motivations. Almost more than he is our actions. Almost. Right? We focus on the actions. Like, yeah, but did, you ever heard that? Like you're riding with somebody and they're saying, they were driving crazy and I thought we were going to get in a wreck and they'll say, yeah, but did you die? Sometimes I think we live our life that way. We say, hey, I had all these thoughts and all this stuff. And I think, yeah, but did I kill anybody? Right? We like to focus on the action. Jesus is focusing on the thing that even causes the thought. 
And our actions, or our lack of action at times, are a badge of honor for someone who doesn't want to break the law, who's a rule follower. Anybody in here a rule follower? Like you say, give me the rules and I'll just know how to do it. See a couple of you. I'm kind of that way, right? I get frustrated when people don't follow the rules too. Like if we're in line and it says merge, and you're one of those people that wants to shoot past everybody and come at the end, I think, nope, uh uh-uh, that's not how it goes. You're supposed to go up and find a place as you go before you get there. You're not going to get in front of everybody. Or you ever been in line, like we recently went through TSA at the the airport, and all of a sudden people start saying, excuse me, and they're coming from behind, and they're just zigzagging in front of people because there's one person in front of them, and there's a whole family that just cuts in front. Like, I get it. It's a family. So, But there's part of me, too, that's like, hey, you can get to the back of the line, right? Or you ever been in line for, like, an amusement park or something like that, and you're in line, and then someone comes in, they're like, oh, come up here with us, like to their friends, and all of a sudden, like 20 people get in front of you, and it's like, yeah. So you might be more of a rule follower than you think. But that's the kind of stuff that sometimes I have to tell myself, like, it's fine, it's no big deal. <laughs> but following the rules and following the law is a badge of honor for some people. They'll say, I've never committed adultery. Which some of us would say, big whoop, you're not supposed to commit adultery. <laughs> Right, But for some people, they say, I've never committed adultery. They'll say, I've never murdered. I've never even ripped the tag off of a mattress. Right? This is a, a rule-focused existence. It focuses on the letter of the law. It maybe even walks up to the line and says, how close can I get without stepping over? But it never crosses it, right? People ask me questions a lot. As a pastor, I think they think that they, they're looking for like validation for what they want to do. And they'll say, can I do this and still be saved? Or do I have to do this to be saved? And some of those questions are fine, right? Because there are certain things that we need to do to be saved and be in a life with Jesus. Sometimes the questions, I, I don't always love that question because they'll say, like, like someone said, do I have to be baptized to go to heaven? And I'm thinking, like, okay, what's, what's the motivation behind that question, right? Like, are you looking for, like, what's the bare minimum I can do and still make it in? Are you looking for, like, hey, how close can the line can I get without doing this? Or they'll say, can I you know, swear and go to heaven? It's like, well, why are you asking me that? Right? Sometimes I want to know the motivation, but people do ask those questions because it's focused on what's the letter of the law that I can step up to without going over rather than what was the heart of the law. Now, sometimes what we, what we do when we see the laws, we can control our behavior. We can slap our hands and say, don't do that. Can you imagine, though, being married to a rule keeper, a letter of the law follower? Like someone that really just takes it all the way. Like someone says, I can think and imagine whatever I'd like as long as I don't follow through. Can you imagine being married to that person? Because that person will be miserable, right? If they're saying, I can think and imagine whatever I want as long as I don't commit adultery. Because they allow their imagination to chase after lustful thoughts that lead to this all unrealistic alternative uh, reality, right? When we start dwelling on what we don't have and think of things that will make us happy, We're creating another reality outside of our mind that we think, you know what? It would be so much better over there. That's what lust does to us. It tells us, you know what? I would be satisfied if I just had this. And so the reality of it is, is it's unrealistic, right? And it's not even real. And so the person becomes miserable. Because what they're saying is, this situation isn't making me happy. How many relationships have you been in where you're in the relationship, and I get it, like there are times when the relationship isn't good, but there are some times when we're in a relationship and we're just like kind of bored. And so we start looking at someone else, we start looking at a different situation and saying, man, that seems so much better. If I was in that, then I'd be happy. And then what we start doing is looking at the situation we're in and saying, this is boring. This isn't making me happy. And so what it does is it takes your current reality and makes it less than. And it makes a current spouse no longer enough. Now, many of us are familiar with the film Jerry Maguire. That was from like the 1990s, I think. Now that's pretty old. Some of you weren't even born yet. Some of you were born for a little bit um, coming up to that. But in the film Jerry Maguire, Tom Cruise emotionally stares into the eyes of Renee Zellweger and he says, you complete me. You complete me. And everybody swooned, and they got their tissues out, and they wiped their eyes and said, oh, sweet. 
But what that demonstrates that along with the lustful thoughts that Jesus talks about is a framework for understanding life where our brokenness and incompleteness are misdiagnosed as unhappiness and we think we'll find happiness in someone that will, that will complete us. And then we begin to look to people as things that can cure our feelings, right? Because what he's saying in that, in that thing is, you complete me. He's not saying, hey, I think we're good together. He doesn't say, hey, I think that we're brought together. He's saying, here's what I get out from you, is that you can complete me, right? She might have been like, whoa, I don't want nothing to do with you. But then he'd be like, but you complete me, right? This idea, though, sometimes that we try to use people as things to, for our own good is most often in display by the infectious and destructive nature of pornography. Because lustful thoughts are given wide open spaces to run through in our minds as we imagine the people from the images that we see giving and bending to our every command and whim to fulfill every single desire we have bringing gratification and happiness. That's the illusion we create through pornography. It's intoxicating to imagine just how perfect it would be if the person on the screen would somehow be with us. And what pornography is and anything else at its base nature is an attempt by broken people to put ourselves back together through the control and manipulation and the expense of someone else, saying, if they'll just do the things that I like, then my life will be so much better. But people are not intended to be used as things. They are not super glue that will fix us. And they are not objects or a means used to achieve our self-centered desires, which can usually boil down to us trying to make ourselves happy. Let's be real. Happiness comes and goes. I was just on a two-week vacation with an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old, and that happiness came and went many times a day at various levels, right? Happiness comes and goes. Situations we were sure would make us happy more often than not did not deliver on what they promised us. You ever experienced that? Like you thought, if I just have this, I would be happy. If I just had, like, we convince ourselves of that, don't we? We say, if I just had this, then I would be happy. I have an 11-year-old that says, if I just had a phone, like everybody else in my school, and I'm the last person standing here without a phone, I would be so happy. Meanwhile, we're listening to an audio book where I'm like, listen to all these stats. It says you won't be happy. You'll actually be the opposite of happy. You'll be depressed, have anxiety, and have social relation problems. But the data aside... Even if it did make you happy for a period, it would not keep that happiness with you. And so allowing lustful thoughts to take root in our lives will create and heighten discontent in the imperfections in your life and even with your spouse. Right? Now, Jesus isn't a letter of the law, only your actions matter kind of guy. And said, Jesus says, your motives and your thoughts matter because it is your heart and your mind that rule your life. And it is your heart and your mind that are made to be the throne of His kingdom. And so there are one of two things sitting on the throne of your life. <coughs> it's either you or Jesus. And I don't want to scare you, but if you get into the pages of Scripture, even when you think you're on the seat of the throne of your life, guess what? It's actually the devil. Not the guy with the pitchfork and the horns and the hooves, but like the actual enemy of your soul. Our hearts and our minds are where the germination begins, where the seeds turn in and start to grow. Now, in God's kingdom, people aren't things. They are His creation made in His image, and they have dignity and worth beyond making you happy. People do not exist. Your spouse does not exist. Other people do not exist solely to make you happy. Most of us learn that sometime when we're coming into our 20s. Some of us, it takes a little longer. Some of us never learn it. But in the kingdom of God, 
People have worth and value and dignity because they are created by God, whether they've done anything that you approve of or not. In fact, they have so much worth that God gave His Son so that they might be rescued. And so you and I have no right to label them and call them something less than because they don't give us what we want. Our relationship with God, our wholeness in God, is in part accomplished through our relationship with others. We are not made complete in having our lust answered and fulfilled. That's true of our spouse, whom we are united with spiritually, and that's also in how we view, think, and treat everyone else. Sometimes we get caught up in the idea that this is our story and everybody else are just secondary players. And they exist to make our life better. You'll see all kinds of sayings, like if that person doesn't help you be a better person, then get rid of them. <laughs> the hard part about that is if you're a Jesus follower, where do you find that in Scripture? Jesus continues, Matthew 5, 29, says this, So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. What I believe Jesus is saying in this passage is, is to deal with the signs of lust at its first appearance. Like as soon as it shows up, deal with it. Plucking out eyes and cutting off hands is an exaggeration to me- that is meant to stir the listeners of this to understand the severity of the situation. Why do we need that? Why do we need Jesus to tell us just how severe the situation is? It's because a lot of times we get too comfortable with sin. We say things like, it's no big deal. We say things like, that doesn't really hurt anybody else, so who cares? But Jesus is saying, you know what? If this even starts to show up and your eye is causing it or your hand is causing it, pluck it out and cut them off. It's not to say you'll never notice someone. It doesn't mean that you won't even have an impulse that has the potential to be lust. But instead, by the grace of God, you don't have to follow that impulse and even beyond. I think it was Martin Luther that said, you know, you can't always stop the thoughts that come into your mind. That's like birds circling. He said, but you don't always have to provide them a nest. I think what Jesus is saying here is, don't get cute. Don't get comfortable with lust. Don't wink at it. Don't excuse it. Instead, resolve before it even shows up that you're going to deal with it at the first sign it comes up. Before it ever takes root, that you're going to deal with it, is what Jesus is saying. He continues and says this, You have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce, but I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Man, this passage, sometimes I'm thinking, like, can we just skip this part? (laughs) Right? Because it's not an easy passage to talk about. But let's keep it in the framework of what Jesus is talking about. Jesus continues this talk about adultery by speaking to reasons for a divorce. Now, the letter of the law was being applied that if a man simply gave a written notice, then divorce was granted. That was kind of the letter of the law, right? People would look and say, how can I get a divorce? Well, you just give a written notice. Oh, okay, I'll do that. But Jesus warns that just like the kingdom of heaven demonstrates there is more to life than what we see around us, marriage is more than just a piece of paper, and sex, which was designed by God to be enjoyed in the context of heterosexual marriage, is more than simply a physical act. There is more going on than what it seems. (coughs) The union taking place with a husband and a wife is more than physical. There is something spiritual as two become one. So merely dismissing a spouse with a written notice reaches far beyond physical separation because you're not just separating two people like they no longer are in proximity of one another. They no longer live in the same house. He's saying there's something spiritual going on. You are breaking apart people that have been joined spiritually. So let me pause here and make sure we understand what Jesus is saying. 
Because Jesus' warning about divorce is not ammunition for me and you to go around and shame somebody who's been divorced. That's not what this is in here for. Now, it's been used that way, has it not? Anybody divorced? Everybody have divorce in their family? I'm a child of divorce. I've heard comments where people have used this as ammunition for other people. But it is not a tool for us to decide who's in and who's out. It is a description of a way of living as a citizen in the kingdom of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit from this point forward. Your life cannot be lived in reverse. We wish it could, right? If I only knew then what I know now. You ever thought that? You ever said that? Are you awake? Okay. <laughs> I, I feel, I'm just feeling like I'm out on a limb by myself in a lot of these things. I don't know how many times I've said, man, if I, if I knew then what I know now, I never would have done it that way. But life isn't lived in reverse, is it? All you can do is say, next time I come to that decision, how will I think about it? Next time I come to that, what will I do? If you hear a passage like this, and you think, I know who needs to hear this, and that person isn't you, then you might be missing the point. Scripture, more often than not, is a mirror for us to look at and say, how am I doing with this? Not, aha, I got you all. <laughs> right? Jesus is, let us not forget, is describing how to live as salt and light, not how to be salty and fight. There should be at least a, a 10 amens in that one. Because so many people we know, not in this church, but in other churches, use the Bible as a way to point out and get into fights with you and say, here's what you're not doing, here's what you should be doing, and here's why you're wrong. And then we start praying, Jesus fix all these other people. And meanwhile, the Holy Spirit's saying, I want to fix you. I want to work on you. Can I, ha can I be your all in all that I can work on you? Or can I just be the all in all for everybody else that you feel needs fixed? The reality of it is, though, is as the more you and I move forward in obedience to the leading of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, the more we are made whole and complete by Him. And the more we are made whole, the more we reflect the completed picture, the picture of King Jesus, the first citizen, that's on the front of the box. So what does salt look like in the context of this passage? At its base level, it looks like saying no to sexual desires that come inappropriately outside the context of marriage. Sometimes we get caught up in, like, how do I stop having these desires? Jesus doesn't say anything about that. He just says, make the decision to say no when they come. Now, for some people, saying no to a desire, sexual or otherwise, might feel like gouging out your eye and chopping off your hand, especially in a world that encourages it and celebrates it. Today, we are said that you are identified by your sexuality. And so what does that say to someone? That I'm not somebody unless I'm engaged in sexual practice. But what Jesus has come to tell us is that we are more than what we do with our bodies, that we are more than any of that, that we are gods and created by him. And so we will never be full, we will never be complete, we will never be fulfilled in that kind of manner. And so if we actually want to be made whole, we must surrender to the designer of the puzzle, not to the voices that tell us to smash it together wherever we just feel like putting the pieces. And so what Jesus describes in this passage as we read it isn't simply more moral commands to try our best not to break the rules, but a transformed way of life that begins in our hearts and our minds. And by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, he says you can live differently because never forget in anything we read in the Bible that Jesus never calls us to anything without also equipping us to be able to answer it. And it's by His grace and by His power that we are able to do so. So when we say things, we are more than conquerors, 
We're not talking about we're more than conquerors running a, tw- a, a, a marathon. I mean, maybe it is in your life. I don't want to say that. But it seems like that's what people boil it down to. We're more than conquerors for our sports team. We're more than conquerors for getting through traffic. No, what he says is we are more than conquerors for the things that trip us up and make us incomplete and broken, that actually through Jesus Christ, sin has been defeated and the fear of death is no longer there by the power of Jesus Christ. And so it's not moral commands that we're just trying not to break, but it's a transformed way of life that begins in our hearts and minds by the grace and the power of God's Spirit. It's the journey of the process of God putting the puzzle of our lives together in a new wholeness, looking more and more like the picture on the box, which is Jesus. We aren't made whole or happy by trying to control people through lust, no more than we're made happy by controlling people through anger. Instead, we can be made whole when we follow King Jesus one step at a time as he leads us by his Spirit. The kingdom of God, I believe, as Jesus describes it, looks like people following Jesus more than following their impulses or desires. That's what this boils down to. That's what last week boiled down to. We have impulses, we have desires, we have a way of thinking sometimes that jump up and it catches us off guard like, man, I got really angry there. But it's learning to recognize that and say, I'm not going to behave that way. We have things that come up and say, all of a sudden I was just caught up in this lust. I was just like, whatever happened. It's it's recognizing, being intentional and saying, before we even get there, I'm not going to say yes to the desire. I'm going to say yes to the life that Jesus has created for us or has shown us. The kingdom of God looks like people treating people with dignity and grace more than treating people as a means to their end. You know where this is really hard? In the service industry. We view waiters, waitresses, and people that take our order a lot of the times. And I don't mean we. It probably mean me and other people I know, but not you. I'm sure. It's, um, but sometimes we view people as they are for us. I've told this story before, but it's one of those. I knew a pastor that we would go to dinner, and I stopped going to dinner with him because I was completely didn't know what to do about it. But he would take a stack of ones and put it on the table. And so when the first drink came out, he would tell the waitress, this is your tip. Every time my drink stays empty for longer than a minute, every time time something happens, like our food comes out late, or if the order is wrong, a dollar comes off the top. I get that people are in a role of service in that way, but the people of God should more than anybody else recognize that people are value worth and dignity regardless of their role. And we don't, people are not there just for us, to make us happy, right? Citizens following King Jesus are surrendered to the process and the journey of their brokenness being redeemed to reflect the complete picture of Jesus. If you're alive, you're not there yet, right? The old saying used to be, you get saved, you get sanctified, you get petrified. But there's no need to get petrified because we're all works in progress. And the reality of it is, is Jesus is more interested in your wholeness than your happiness. Now, does that mean you can't be happy? No. But it means he wants to make you whole and he wants to make you new. And the brokenness of our puzzle cannot be made whole without him. Jesus is calling me and calling you to a better future. So many times we look in the past and say, if I only knew then what I know now. But thanks be to God that you know now how to move forward. He's calling us to a future that is filled with potential and bursting with the possibility, the possibility of being made new continually. Does anybody remember that song from kids camp back in the day that was like, I'm a promise. I'm a possibility. I'm a prompt. Anybody remember that? What is the capital P? I can't sing good, but you got to listen anyway. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, that, I make up my own lines just because I don't remember them. But that's what they're talking about. Is I, am a, I have potential and I have possibility by the grace of God to be different in the future than I have been in the past. 
The world around me can look different than it does today and how it has been up to this point by the grace of God. And so the question that you and I have to answer in every decision that we make is will we follow the call of Jesus when a fork in the road of life comes? Or will we see what a future being made new looks like? Will we do that? Or will we trade dignity as a commodity to try to make our own way of making ourselves whole and happy in the way that we think is best? Will you use others, or will you allow yourself to be used, hoping that that will somehow make you whole? Or will you surrender to the one who made the puzzle, who has the beautiful picture of wholeness in mind? Now, if you're already surrendered to King Jesus, let me encourage you today to not give up. Don't give up because there, you're still missing some picture, some pieces in your puzzle. Don't give up because the puzzle isn't complete yet. You are still a work in process on the journey towards wholeness as long as you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. And the good thing is when we see that Jesus is calling us to Him, and if we take a step off to one side, we're not completely lost. We can say, oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. Let me take the right step back towards you. And so as you move forward into the future that He is calling you into, You can be made whole more and more every day. I want to encourage you, listen to that voice. Move towards the voice that says this is the way to live and live in the promise of being made new. Because that will happen. Now for those of you that haven't surrendered to the way of Jesus Christ, I just want to ask you, what are you waiting for? Maybe you surrendered at one point in time and you thought, you know what, that didn't really work for me. Or you know what, I took a couple steps towards him and I got completely lost. Or maybe I just, it was really frustrating. I didn't find myself happy. I just have a question that Jesus asked often. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be well? Because I'm telling you, and I know now what I didn't know then, even though he's still teaching me, is that He can put the pieces of your life together to make you journey towards wholeness more than you ever could in chasing down your desires and what you think is going to make you happy. He created life. He knows the way to live. The question is, will you follow Him to that? Will you stand with me?